Yes, it's What a Boast, a celebration of Reeves and Mortimer. Please welcome your hosts for this podcast, MJ Price and Paula Wiseman. Hello and welcome to Quite a Boast, a podcast dedicated to the work and genius of Vic Reeves and Bob Mortimer. My name is Matt Price, founder of the Reeves and Mortimer Depository of Curious Stuff Facebook group. And I am Paula Wiseman, founder and creator of the Divine Comedians podcast. We are joined today by a television legend, a man who has, for the best part of 40 years, interviewed everyone who's anyone. Plus, I'm sure a few people who probably ain't all that. He has also played an integral part in bringing Victory's Big Night Out into the nation's living rooms and has crossed paths with them both personally and professionally several times over the years, from sitting in a bin that was being violently struck by a cricket bat on Shooting Stars to providing some melodic whistling on the I Will Cure You album. Please enter the Novelty Island paddock, Jonathan Ross. Hey! I just did the... Mr. Buzzcock whistling for you. Oh, yeah. yeah it's too high pitched. It's I too remember high-pitched. punk rock. Yeah, I'll do it again. <laughs> <laughs> My dog didn't wow. enjoy that. Still pitch perfect after all these years. Perfect. <laughs> One take wonder. One take That's wonder, what? exactly. <laughs> we would have had a hit without that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, thanks so much for coming on the podcast, Jonathan. It's great it's to see pleasure. you. I enjoy reminiscing sometimes, and I particularly enjoy uh, reminiscing about those two once young men. <laughs> <laughs> So let's start off, like talking a little bit about your beginnings, go back a bit further in time. My mum was a, my mum was a frustrated. She wanted to be performed. She was a, a kind of you know housewife in Langston, East London, and she'd always, mm. like many women of that generation, she was under the impression that she could have and should have been Shirley Temple. Um, <laughs> she would, you know, I, I've met a lot of women from that generation who said, "Yeah, there were auditions in England. They went to find a Shirley Temple, and I was almost there." And my mum said that, but she always had showbiz ambitions and loved that, and kind of wanted much for us. Uh, and so I wasn't really a child actor, but she saw an advert. She used to buy the stage newspaper. This I think yeah. it's still going. It's a kind of peculiar industry thing, but it's very, mm. it was very sort of, uh, what's the word? A sort of old fashioned style anyway back then. And I used to love it for different reasons. Jesse brings me to Jim and Bob in a weird sort of way, but she would look for adverts in the back. There was one saying large families wanted for commercials. So right. she applied for that. And, and we went to this weird, weird acting agency called uh, the Wendy Wisby Acting School or something over in Twickenham I think it was and they signed us up to do TV commercials so I never did acting per se we were essentially like moving props yeah you know yeah. they'd want to be family so we turned to that but I was never I never had any acting training and never did any had any parts or anything sorry that's spooky spooky <laughs> hey, um he's disagreeing with my my memory <laughs> um, so I, we weren't actors and my mum was at it and later in life though she did start she was doing extra work and mm. she got a kind of regular spot on EastEnders yeah. um, so I, I hope I don't sound immediately and tediously pedantic but but we weren't a kind <laughs> of showbiz family at all you know we were like a fairly in some ways a very regular East London family but in other ways the fact that both my parents kind of were had left school very very young my mum mm. at uh, 13 my dad at 15 I think and had started working but they had they were sort of self-taught. My dad had read a lot and they were interesting people. And I think they wanted something more from us than, than we were actually being funneled towards by the uh, rather good school system available back then. And so we weren't we weren't in showbiz per se, but I think my mum always saw it as this kind of like promised land. Yeah, yeah. And she did hope we would get there somehow, maybe some way. Do you do some appearances? Were you in the, the two Ronnies, uh, a top of the pop sketch or something oh, like that? Am I right in saying? I'll be fast forward to when I'm a sort of teenager, and I'm, I'm, and somehow, somehow, some dodgy way, my dad managed to get hold of an equity card. The unions were very tight back then. Yeah. And yeah. the name on the card, there was John Ross was already taken. That was his name. So he, he had an equity card name of John Thurston. And of course, they didn't really give a shit who turned up as long as you were a, a male of roughly that. So. The whole family used to use it. All the boys used to use it. <laughs> but if I went up and said there's a day's extra work, 
is John available? We'd say, yeah. And one of us would turn up and get the 18 or 20 quid that it was for that. So, yeah, I was in two episodes of the Two Ronnies. One I'm particularly fond of. You can find it online. There was a, a pop, top pop countdown. It was like a top of the pop spoof. Mm. And they dug me out and they said, we want some people to be in the countdown. We'll take photographs. It's an extra three quid or something. And I thought, fuck me, they're gonna, I'm going to be David Bowie for sure. But instead, they poofed up my hair, and I was a version of Barry Manilow. Called, <laughs> called, and this was to add to the insult called Barely Man Enough. <laughs> uh, but but work on that was great, because the two Wannies, so I, I only met Big Wannie once on a plane years later, and he was very oh, funny man. and very friendly. Mm. Uh, little Wannie I knew quite well, and he was amazing. Um, and, of course, a huge talent. Both of them were massively talented. But it was just great seeing them work on the day and being there. I just loved being at them. I was also in an episode of Terry in June, yeah, where I played a street tough who, when Terry had the temerity to tell us to keep our noise down the street, we lift him up and put him in a basketball hoop. <laughs> um, <laughs> and even back then, I was somewhat admiring of Terry Scott because, you know, he was a big star and he was a, an older man. But mm. on the day, they didn't have any stunderman. So they just put, a, we were outside, they put a ladder up to a fucking basketball hoop. He climbed up and he sat in this basketball hoop for like half hour. <laughs> which I wouldn't want to do. I'm probably older than he is now, but then he was then, but it's like, I wouldn't want to do that. So I was in there. I was in a few bits and pieces. My, the high point of my uh, dubious acting career was with my father. We both played Israeli soldiers in a low budget film called The Raid on, on to, Entobi, or Entebbe, which was the Idi Amin regime raid. Uh, and it's a sequence where we run in as soldiers, both looking very unconvincing. And it's intercut with a, 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 a sort of uh, Idi Amin having a threesome. Oh my God! <laughs> like a sort of soft core Paul movie, but we played a couple of earnest Israeli soldiers. Here. <laughs> so I did lots of bits pieces, but I was in a few comedy things. I was in uh, I was in A and R Fat Mum twice, um, which was fun. And oh, so you know, I I always loved that kind of comedy anyway. And so, but really, I, I did it. I was a student, and I do it because you get twenty quid. You know, I didn't have any ambitions to necessarily take it any further, particularly. But it was great fun at the time. You don't know at the time when you're doing it. The, how big these shows are going to be? Well, I mean, the last I was in the last ever episode of Ain't Our Mum, so I kind of knew it was a big thing for me mm. to watch. It was both exciting and always somewhat, not depressing, but somewhat, it diminished it somewhat, being part of it. Because when you saw the Nuts and Bolts and the Cogs movie, then obviously you saw the reality rather than the delightful fiction, which is what you enjoyed in the first place, yeah. you know. Um, and so it was, it, but it was essentially, it was just easy cash. Yeah. <laughs> So, so what what was Last Resort and Channel X? So about eighty. So Channel Four started eighty two. I started working as a researcher for Channel Four, showing about eighty three. Mainly, there used to be there were a couple of style magazines around the time. The Face, which was amazing, Blitz, mm. which was fun, but Blitz yeah. was no one who was good. But I remember reading an interview with someone in Blitz when I was a struggling student, and he said, "Oh, you should get a job in the media. It's the best job in the world. It's so much, so much fun. It's so easy. They pay so well. If you're not working in the media, you're mad." And I thought, actually, that makes sense. And my brother, Paul, who had studied as a journalist at an English university, become a, and he'd gone the traditional route of getting into TV, which was how it was done before all of the independents were set up. So in the old mm. days, you know, you had to have a journalistic background and then you'd get in as a junior. And it was very hierarchical. Um, and he had gone from working at a local newspaper in Canterbury to working for London Weekend TV. And I actually went for an, uh, an interview for a job that came up on the weekend TV because if you bought The Guardian on a Thursday, I don't know if they still do it, they used to have media um, job uh, advertising going on. And I saw they were looking for on the six o'clock show he worked on, which mm. Danny Baker was the one kind yeah. of beacon. But it was a fun, silly show. It was like the one show of its day, but it was better. And um, mm. I went on for an interview, you could see, and I, and I could see during the course of the interview, the woman realizing I knew fuck all and had absolutely <laughs> nothing to bring to the table. There was just this sense of her thinking, this is a waste of everyone's time. Yeah. So I didn't get that. So I brushed up a little bit. And I said, then, then I took the trouble of speaking with them and say, actually, what is it you actually do? And found out what the job entailed. <laughs> then when a job came up for Loose Talk, which was a, a Channel 4 um, late night live talk show hosted by called Steve Taylor, who used to be the uh, assistant editor, or the associate editor at The Face. And I went along for that job and I, I lied uh, that I'd already worked at LWT. I said I'd had worked there for a year, which I hadn't, and they didn't check. And I'm sure I lied about the degree I had. I probably lied about most things. But anyway, they liked me, I think. And they liked the ideas I came along with for the show, which were were, were fine, I'm sure, but I don't think any of them were particularly workable or revolutionary. I think one of the things they did like about me, which brings about this podcast, is the fact that 
the woman who's in charge there, one called Maddie French, who I liked an awful lot. She was one of the producers and she helped run this small company called RPM Productions. They did a lot of music TV in those early days of Channel 4. Uh, she liked the fact that, unlike most people came along, I wasn't dismissive about older comedians and older showbiz. Hmm. And I, one of the things I said to her is I, I said, I think there's some people who are, and, and this has been something that's been constant throughout my career on TV. There are people who, people of my age still love, but we don't see anyone on TV. I said, I'd love to get Max Wall on the show. I'd like yeah. to get Tommy Cooper on the show. He's still alive then, of course. I said, I'd like to get Diana Dawes on the show. And I did actually get Diana Dawes on the show one week. I said, you should try and get Spike Milligan on the show because he's brilliant and anarchic and different to anything else he's going at the moment. And we did book him once, but he didn't turn up. He had one of his depressed days and didn't, wouldn't leave his house. And we were doing it live in Deptford, so we managed to persuade Jules Holland to come out of his studio for the afternoon. So that was a great experience, and it was a great fun thing to do. And, and it wasn't a particularly well-watched show, but I, I felt so blessed because I met so many incredible people that I was interested in or fan of. I managed to book Tom Waits on the show once. And this was it was live from the Albany Empire in Deptford, which is bizarre because that was yeah. where the big night out used to perform. But we did this live show from there. So that's why I knew the Albany Empire before I ever met Vic or Bob. And I, so I, I remember once sitting for a whole afternoon with Tom Waits in the Albany Empire Deptford, which was essentially, you know, they tell me, it was sort of like a community centre downstairs. Hmm. And um, saying to me, because he didn't know where to go, and, they, left and he said, have we got any lunch? I said, well, we didn't even have a canteen there. I said, oh, we normally go out and get some like fish and chips. And he went, oh, I never had fish and chips. So I went out and got fish and chips. <laughs> and we sat in this basically a kid's art room fucking Tom Waits, and I gave him the fish and chips, and he looked at me and went, don't you have any cutlery? And I went, no, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> and so he had to eat the fish and chips with his fingers like I did. And I remember, I was so inexperienced, I hadn't thought, oh, I should get some cutlery. Yeah. Um, but it was such a weird thing, and it was such an amazing thing. We had Neil Kinnock on just before he was announced leader of the Labour Party. <clears> we had this mortal coil, Pete Townsend on, back before the funny business. We had, <laughs> um, we had uh, I had John Cooper Clark on, and John Cooper Clark I'd booked. And um, I was so looking forward to seeing him because I so loved him. I mean, he did that one that goes burger bar, blank, burger bar. I think it's that, it might be Beasley Street. I'm not sure. But anyway, just before going live, they said, to uh, John's disappeared. I'm like, fuck, I fuck. And I was maybe looking after him. I said, I'll find him, I'll find him. I went out, I couldn't find him in here. And the clock was ticking. He was going to be on this live show. So the slot was there in about two minutes. And I went into the toilets and he passed out with his work still dangling out of his fucking arm. Oh, no. So he'd done a hit of something and he passed it. So I, so I had to, I was about 23 and fairly close. I pulled the syringe out of his arm and shook it. I said, John, John, are you alive? And he went, yeah, yeah. I went, you are? And he went, great. And he stood up and went and just fucking did it. <laughs> like it was, and it was like a faultless performance. Wow. So, uh, and there was a, and the se I was on the second series only. The first series, there was some trouble there once. And Seamus Cassidy, he was quite an important figure as well because mm. he was a commissioning editor alongside Mike Bolland. Uh, and I think he was the one probably in charge when, when the Big Night Out went there to Channel 4. So um, <laughs> I worked on that for a while. And then, and then I drifted into other shows. I stayed with RPM for a while. I worked on a number of different and fairly eclectic shows. Then I wound up working at a company called Action Time. And Action Time was a company run by a very smart guy called Jeremy Fox, who had developed the Krypton Factor for um, Granada TV, but didn't own any of the rights of it. And because they wanted to keep him happy, he said, well, look, let me develop stuff for you and, and co-own some of it. And he would fly out to America and buy weird formats for game shows and things that had been forgotten, like daytime stuff. Bring them back, give them a polish, change them slightly and sell them to people for like daytime TV. He also, in this package of stuff he bought accidentally from one of the companies selling it, had about he bought like three or four game shows and some sort of other show. But in the package was Soul Train. And, and he realised that Channel 4 might want it. So he mentioned to John Cummings, and Cummings said yes. He was a commissioner editor for Youth TV then. And um, he wanted some people to make it. So I went for that job. And the person he'd already been working with on something else was a guy called Alan Mark. And so yeah. that's how Alan and I met. We both started working on Soul Train at the same time. Alan had the more fun job. He went, I think he was a bit more experienced than me, but about the same age though. Yeah, we are the same age, I think. I think we're, yeah, we share the same birthday, bizarrely, which we also shared with Peter Cook. Um, and he, uh, he got the job of flying out to meet Don Cornelius and go through the files and choose which clips they'd show. And in the second series, we called it Solid Sun. We just didn't go through Soul Trains. It was too expensive for license. But so we worked on that for a while. And while we were working on that, I was very keen to get ahead anyway, and I was doing other jobs in the evening for Action Time. So I was doing Soul Train during the day. In the afternoon, I'd work on a show called Revid, which was a video review show hosted by Gary Crowley and John Stephen Fink. And I'd run around. I was setting up a show for someone at the Edinburgh Festival and seeing loads of comedy acts. And I was also working on developing other, other game shows for this guy. So I'd work on something like Pass the Buck, 
which uh, yeah. which starred that comedian. What was his name? His first name was Lenny, and he used to have an absurd poem. In the 80s. Lenny Bennett. Lenny, Lenny Bennett. Bennett. Yeah. I worked with the great Lenny Bennett on Pastor Buck. I worked with George Layton on Crosswords. I booked <laughs> guests for Frame with Davis. This was like my third job. So I was doing Soul Train during the day. Then I do Revit for two or three hours. And then I spent an hour before going home on these things. So and it suited me because I just split up for my first girlfriend. I was living alone in a little flat in Notting Hill, and it was great. It was a great time. I enjoyed it. But Alan and I were keen to go ahead, and we both uh, had heard of the Letterman Show in America. And we got hold of some tapes of that. And we were just surprised no one was doing anything like that. And then we realised, a bit more discovery, that the kind of roots of talk show, the kind of grammar of the talk show had got fairly locked in the UK. Mm. Des O'Connor was still doing the one where you'd feed a comedian a line and it was more for comic effect. But essentially, they'd become more... Parkinson had so stamped his brand on the mould that everyone seems to think in the UK that's where they should be. And there's still a residue of that. It's quite bizarre. Um, they still think they should be these kind of like in-depth interviews. And I always thought Parkin was good, of course, but I thought maybe Snickelson was better. But, you know, there was always a place for that as well as a more comedy one. And we wanted to do one that was very much like Letterman or like early Carson or early Jack Parr. And so we were working on ideas for that. And then we were looking for a host. I secretly wanted a host, but I felt too embarrassed about admitting that. We yeah. asked various people. Um, one of them was Jeremy. Oh, what was his name? He was a very good political comedian, who's also now sadly dead. Jeremy Hardy. Jeremy Hardy. Yeah, I remember going up with Jeremy Hardy. I saw him live at Edinburgh and thought he was amazing. And unwisely approached him in the toilet afterwards and said, Jeremy, I'm working on a show idea with a friend of mine for Channel 4. And he said, fuck off. <laughs> Quite right. We both had our dicks out at the time. I hadn't yet learned the protocol. I was just excited. Yeah. Uh, and, and we asked a couple of other people. Uh, and Jeremy always used to, whenever I bumped into him, he'd always say, I still, I still regret the fact I turned that down. And then Channel 4, Mike Bolland was in charge of Entertainment Channel 4. And he... He had worked very closely with the people at RPM. He'd been in the same section of the BBC before Channel 4 started called the Community, uh, it was called the Community Group or something. And they did like access TV as much as anything. And he was keen. So we'd go and see him. And basically, I would bring the show alive in the office. I would act out jokes and routines. And then he said, you should try hosting it. Do you want to try hosting it? And of course, that was my heart soared at that. But I was also mm. terrified. Uh, and we agreed I'd try a couple out. And so I did a couple of open mic spots at the Comedy Store in London with material one or two jokes i wrote myself one or two i stole from a letterman book that had come out and one or two i got from a friend of mine who was a kind of jobbing comedian called robin robin oh, robin egger who was a nice guy and he was his day job was driving for jeremy fox at action time and he gave me a couple of his jokes which weren't terribly good um but i kind of did okay and i only did i didn't do it because i wanted to be a comedian i did it because i wanted to get the experience of standing in front of an audience telling a joke and feeling the response and seeing if I could deal with the response if it didn't work mm. or if it didn't work so I got the experience there and then and then the guys were the guy we were put together with when we got given a pilot we we did it with one guy called Jeremy another guy and it went quite well but they wanted us to work with a more established company so Channel X even though we'd done nothing we were given a co-production deal with a, a guy called Colin Callender who'd been very successful he went on to be very very big at HBO for about 25 years in America Told me for lunch once with Sidney Poitier, but that's another story. Wow. Um, and he he um he kind of like housed us in his office, which was at 80 Wardle Street or 82 Wardle Street, just two or three doors mm -hmm. down from the marquee before Wardle Street changed so much. It was a great spot to be in. And um they hired we had actors come in and I would rehearse doing interviews with them, not as themselves, but I, they'd say, Okay, you're a guy, he's a guy who's done this, he's found the world's biggest shell, you know. So the sort of stuff we yeah. wanted to do on the show we do, and then we did a couple of pilots very low budget ones one went well the second one went so badly i've got the tape somewhere we we christened it black wednesday because it was our worst ever day but we got <laughs> we got given the show and i was obviously terrified initially it wasn't live initially it went out friday nights at 12 30 but after it got a very warm reception after about two or three weeks they moved it and mike said i love live tv he'd been instrumental in getting the tube off the bed he said would you consider doing it live and not knowing any better, I said, sure. And so we started, <laughs> we started doing it live at 10.30 on Friday night. So it was a, it, and it, in some ways, I look back with enormous fondness, but it was a terrifying period, really, of my life, you know, mm -hmm. um, because I was worried that the, uh, I've just got a taste of doing something that I love doing, but at the same time, I felt really so tense and nervous and scared of doing it. And so the moment of the week that I enjoyed the most actually was doing the show. But during the rest of the week, there was a gradual buildup of tension and discomfort until I got another show out of the way. And I remember at the time, I mean, obviously, as you said in the intro, I've met most people. I was talking with someone from AHA once, not Morton, one of the other guys. And he'd done yeah. a smash hits interview at the time. And they said, what's your favourite thing on TV? 
And he said, the last resort on a good night. And then the next question was, you can see where this is going. What's your <laughs> yeah. least favourite thing on TV? He said, the last resort on a bad night. And you know what? He wasn't wrong. Because when it was good, it was obviously, oh, yeah. you know, good for the time. When it was bad, it was fucking unwatchable. Um, and <laughs> fortunately, there, there were more good than bad, um, I would think. So I did that for a while. And, and then because we had Channel X, I wanted to do more shows. But I didn't, it's odd, I didn't want the company to be big in that we wanted to be earning more money particularly and I didn't want it to be big so I wanted to be grandiose from the company I just wanted to see more shows on TV that I wanted to watch yeah exactly so I suppose there was a degree of vanity involved there so I remember once going along and and, and I realized I, I began to see how the industry worked a little bit how you would take something and try and develop it and take it to someone and find out what they wanted and and I remember going out for lunch with Peter Cook who I was quite close to and saying Peter you should be on TV more you know, without realising it was a slight kind of hubris and arrogance of youth. But I said, you yeah. should want to more. And he said, I don't really want to do anything much. And I said, well, just a kind of real low impact show for you. Why don't we just have you? It doesn't have to be live. We just have you sitting in a small club restaurant and we could feed you story ideas or you could look through the newspaper and you could just ramble on what caught you eye and what you thought and maybe take questions for the audience. And it might have worked. It might have been fun. And I said, look, I'm, I'm 100% sure I can get you a non-broadcast pilot. And I remember this was about 11 in the morning. We were sitting in a restaurant called Zen W3 in Hampstead. Five minutes after we left, George Michael was walking in afterwards. It was a very starved place and a great time. And Peter Cook sitting there. And I said to him, I'm sure I can get you a non-broadcast pilot. And he took a drag in his cigarette and he went, I would definitely be interested in a non-broadcast series. <laughs> 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 so, so it was a fun time so we were casting around for stuff and they kept asking me to do other bits and pieces which I did one or two things never never with any enormous success and meanwhile the BBC had been courting me a little bit and I'd done I think we started doing Comic Relief already and I'd done Bits Bits Radio but then my brother Adam who uh, has been in various rock bands over the years and currently uh, sort of manages Adam Ant I, I was having lunch or a drink with him one day and he said I saw this really funny bloke the other day I think you should check out he was DJing. He hadn't seen the big night. He said he was DJing. He was DJing at some um, gossips in Meard Street, which is a club I used to go to quite a lot back in the day. It used to be called Billy's when it was like a, a new romantic club before the Blitz or about the same time as the Blitz. And it was called Gazzy's Rockin' Blues on a Thursday night. And there was a soul night and it, it became Mega City later on, which was a sci-fi kind of city. Like, so the way London light, nightlife was so kind of like fun and and um, the, the imagination that went into club nights was very interesting back then. So it was a tiny mm-hmm. little club, but different things every night. And on a Monday night, when no one knew it, this guy was DJing. He said, I saw this guy DJing, and he, he had a really weird look about him, and he was wearing a horse brass <laughs> around his neck. And he stopped the music on stage. He went out, and he, he sang his own version of All Right Now by Free. And I said, oh, it, it sounds fun. I'll go along. <laughs> so I, I went along the next Monday night, and it was Vic, of course. And so... I saw him and it was basically in the club. There were like six or seven young women on like a hen night. Me and Bob Mortimer was there to watch him. Oh, right. And and he came out and he did do all right now. And Dorian was there and Dorian did, um, I think he's the man who broke the bank of Monte Carlo. And you can mm. imagine this went down very, very badly with the <laughs> hen party <laughs> who just wanted to hear, you know, some Kylie or something. Um, but Jim playing a combination of weird sort of like 70s Rocky Love. He, he loved playing, he played Cream and Hendrix and all that. But it was a very fun night. And I was chatting afterwards. Bob came up and spoke to me. And for the first six months I knew him, I was convinced they were a gay couple because <laughs> I didn't know at that, that time. It hadn't, I didn't know that, the, I didn't know anything about the big night out. And Bob came up and said, oh, hello, yeah, yeah, your brother said you might come down. I went, oh, yeah. Yeah, he did, yeah. He said, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm Jim's partner. So I thought partner. <laughs> Like that. So even when I saw them on stage, it didn't. I didn't change my initial evaluation. <laughs> so I was very surprised when I was introduced that they both had girlfriends. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, I, I I loved seeing on that. So I went for lunch with Jim about a week later. I said, "Let's go find this." And that's when he told me they did Big Night Out, which I hadn't heard of him then. And and this was already it already had a fairly solid East London, South East London following. I mean, a lot of people mm-hmm. were going down to it, but I'd never heard of it because, bear in mind, the world was a much smaller place in some ways or something there was no communication no one shared clips or anything there was no internet i mean this was i think the internet was just about to start then i think i had a an email address it was compuserve 100673 or something and you had to use <laughs> two different pieces of software one to send the mail another one to find the mail it was it was very early days so there was no clip sharing 
mobile phones, most people didn't have a mobile phone yet even. You yeah. know, so you'd hear about something by a word of mouth or like the enemy would write about it or time out or something. Mm. And so it was beginning to make some small waves, but mainly locally. Uh, and, and so we had this lunch. And at the lunch, by the way, which I, I remember very clearly lunch, I remember buying, he, he told me he was an artist because, you know, he'd studied at art school, which is where he met Fred, I think. And he um, he bought two of his paintings on and I bought them both off him. And I said, how much do you want? He said, uh, give us a ten or each. I said, I can't give a fucking ten. So I gave him like 100 quid for each of them. I've still got them. One's a brilliant kind of blue pastel painting of like Elvis with slightly odd eyes. And the other one's a pen and ink drawing of Elvis with eyes. Wow. And then he gave me he gave me as a gift a sort of ink sketch of Tommy Trinder ironing his trousers. And the only other piece of artwork I've got from Jim was years later. I, I there was a night when Bruce Forsyth and Ronnie Corbett hosted the I think it was the BAFTAs, but it might be something else together. And it was a fucking disaster. <laughs> and, and we were all watched and all loved how much it tanked. And I said, Jim, will you do me a picture of that? So he said, I've got a picture <laughs> by Jim of, of um, Bruce Forsyth and Roddy Corbett failing miserably, hosting some big TV show. Um, so then I told Alan about this. I said, look, I've seen this guy, Alan Mark, my partner at Channel X. I've seen this guy. He's very old. It's very different. I, I don't know what the show's like. Let's go down and see the show. And Alan had heard about The Big Night as well. I think someone had told him about it because he was um, quite close friends with Gary Crowley from the mod days. And I think mm -hmm. someone had told Crowley about this thing. That, and Crowley was very tapped into, like, you know, what was happening in London. So we went down together. And, of course, you know, it was amazing. People in the crowd knew it. They knew the catchphrases. A lot of them did, not everyone, but they knew the catchphrases. They knew the cast of characters, and it was, it was shambolic, and it was longer, obviously, in the TV experience. But it had a real kind of punk energy in a fun way, and everything was there. As far as I could see, all the components were there that you need for an amazing show. You know, we both mm. left feeling like, oh my god, we've just seen something revolutionary and so different to everything else going on. No one else was doing. No one else had created their own world. You know, you'd see people doing odd acts at the comedy store. You know, there was a guy called the amazing Podomoski, for example, he used to do stuff with sound effects. But no one had their own cast of characters. No one had created, no one had found a group of similar minded misfits to create a world. And so we were really, you know, so impressed and so delighted by the experience and so hoped we could be part of something. Uh, and so I spoke to them and said, look, you know, really, we think you could get this on TV. And Here's a, I think you'll enjoy this anecdote because in uh, Bob's book, which I'm sure you've both read, he talks about me going down there and saying that I was going to be Michael Gray and Alan Yentob down. And Alan Yentob years later told him, oh, he couldn't make it because he was at a funeral. Do you remember that in the book? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's fucking bullshit. <laughs> I, took, I took Michael Gray, I took Yentob down once and I sat at a fucking table with Yentob and we watched Big Night Out. And I took Gray down the week after because my plan was to play them off against each other. So that if they were only lukewarm, I could say, you know, BBC Two wants it. And yeah, they're interested. And Yentob came back to me and said, I love Vic. I don't think the rest of it works. I don't think Bob works. I don't think the show works. We're just about to bring back Jukebox Jury to tell Vic he could host Jukebox Jury. Now, right. here's where my memory goes a bit straight. So he definitely fucking went. I can't <laughs> remember whether I even told Jim that. I think I didn't tell Jim. I remember thinking I'm not going to tell him that because that's A, insulting, and B, bullshit. But I might have told him. I might have told him. I know I never told Bob that because why would you? But mm. I, 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 I might have told Jim and said, look, I don't think you should do this. Either way, I either told Jim and said, don't accept this, or I didn't tell Jim at all, which I think mm. is what happened. So then the week after the grade went down, I took grade down. I sat at the same fucking table. I sat with Yen Top and grade liked it. And I said, Alan was here last week. He really likes it. We'd rather do it with you because we're with you. He said, fine. He said, well, can we make some changes? I said, I don't think they want to make any changes, Michael. And I think Alan's happy with it as he is. He said, okay, fine. Then we, so we got the commission. Wow. And I, well, I think they went straight to a series. I think they came straight to a series. And the thing is, I do remember doing a pilot. And we did it at Ewart's TV, which was in Wandsworth. that later became Capital Studios. It was owned by an old, very sweet old guy called Keith Ewer, who used to be a photographer and set the studio. That's where we did the last resort. And it's where there used to be two old ladies there who did the, the cooking in the canteen, Gladys and Val. And Gladys <laughs> and Val who were very sweet. And then towards the end, they got a young assistant in who was Ainsley Harrier. He used to drive, <laughs> who was a terrible fucking cook. And he used to drive everyone crazy <laughs> by telling them how famous he was going to be one day. And we'd go, great, lovely, great. I'm very pleased for you. 
can't wait. Can I have a stuffed pepper, please? <laughs> um, so it was a funny little almost family one thing. Now, I wasn't really that involved in shaping it for TV. That was Alan much more than me. Mm. Because I was working on my stuff, and and you know he so he he would be an interesting person for you to talk to about that. And of course, he's been involved with them all through. You know, after I uh, sort of somewhat acrimoniously left Channel X, uh, he stayed there, and obviously so did Vic and Bob. So he's worked with them on many things like Shooting Stars and that. We I think he did that weird Saturday night thing they did as well, and he did Smell of Reeves and Mortimer I think as yeah, well. Yeah. And, you know, Oh, he's had a long, long relationship. I mean, I've stayed friends with them both, but I haven't really worked with them that much. Yeah. But anyway, it came, and th- th- so then that it happened, basically. Big night out happened, and it was deservedly a hit. I don't know what sort of figures it was getting, but I'm sure. Weird thing is, TV figures have sort of fallen off a cliff in the last couple of years anyway with streaming. Mm. But back then, if you were getting, on Channel 4, I mean, last result, the first series, we managed to get 5 million one week, which was extraordinary, even then. But that was a, an anomaly. I think on average we were getting about three, three and a half, which today you'd fucking kill for on oh, any yeah, channel. Summer night. But I, I think Jim and Bob were doing well. I don't think they did quite as well as that. And my my, my success had tailed off a little bit by then. Anyway, I wasn't getting those sort of figures, but I think they were getting like one and a half, two million, which was solid and good. Yeah. But more importantly, it was a very pure demographic they were getting. And you could sense how the impact it was having culturally. You know, yeah. you could sense the kind of the change it was bringing about in terms of... um what comedy was on tv and and how people interacted with it you know and the fact that catchphrases became cool again you know mm-hmm. and some people do not i think mary whitehouse experience slightly predated it and and that bob and uh, sorry rob newman and david Badil, of course had got a couple of catchphrases there and, and so had pun and dennis that people like and they became became almost the kind of cliche that students like saying milky milky or <laughs> yeah know, yeah See that dog turd over there, that's your mum, that is, you know, um, which sort of always which was a very reductive way of dealing with the cleverness of the comedy to begin with. But I think there was certainly a change there. I remember speaking to Badil, who's like one of my closest friends now, and he was saying that he, he they never want, they never thought we would want to work with the channel X. They never came to something because they thought we only liked surreal comedy because the stuff mm. I did in the last resort was often a bit strange. And certainly Jim and Bob was way out there, you know, Rick and Bob, sorry. Um, so, uh, and, and it was success and, you know, we were happy to do it. I mean, that, that's kind of how it all began. I can tell you a couple of other things from that period. I remember, I remember Bob coming to me once and said, they'll be written a kind of one-off thing. We're really pleased with it. And he gave me a script to read and it was the weekenders. And I remember reading yeah. it and thinking, this is fucking terrible. Um, <laughs> and in my defense, A, I'm not very good at seeing the potential script, but B, it is terrible when it's just on the page. <laughs> But when they are doing it, mm. I mean, if you write down the script of The Big Night Out, until it's brought alive with that kind of manic commitment and the visuals match it so brilliantly, you know, like if someone tried to explain to you the stops, mm. it, it might seem problematic. Whereas when you <laughs> see it, it's sort of brilliantly funny and just somehow works, even though it doesn't, it's very hard to drill down into it and work out why it works. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's not just silly voices and high foreheads and weird shoes, but somehow all of them together, it just they make it work. I mean, actually, this this might interest you. I remember once I was doing in the very early, I think, I think before Big Night Out was on TV, I'd been asked to do a benefit. It was an age charity benefit. Ned Sherin asked me to do it, and I said, sure. I said, I've got these young guys who are fucking amazing. Can I bring them along and do something? She said, okay. So I brought them along. I said, can they do a bit? He said, well, not really. No one knows who they are. It was all named people. He said, but I said, well, what if I did a bit with them? He said, okay. So I went on stage with Jim instead of Bob to do something. And I was terrible. And it was weird because I was so excited when Jim said, well, look, if you want to do that, you know that with Jim. I said, yeah, yeah, fucking yeah. I was so excited to be doing it. So, And then it was only when I did it, I realized that I couldn't do it. Mm. You know, and their chemistry was so crucial to what they had. Mm. You know, and so and so for a while, you know, Vic got the attention. It was all Jim, Jim, Jim. Vic got the attention, but of course, Jim and Jim is funny anyway. They're both funny in their own. But without Bob, the the double act, so it wasn't like Little and Large, you know, yeah. or yeah. even Malcolm and Wise. Not that Ernie didn't do his share, but it was more that they, they were both key players when they were on stage. You know, they both really. So so that was that was a kind of interesting moment, something which I should have been able to figure out anyway. Yeah, so then we, we did that, and then I left Channel X in circumstances that weren't as straightforward as they might have been. 
uh, and Alan carried on there in circumstances that weren't as straightforward as they might have been. <laughs> um, uh, and the boy stayed there, of course. I didn't try to lure them away. I wouldn't have wanted to do that because I didn't set another company up for quite a while anyway. Mm. Um, but I always followed with great you know, enthusiasm what they did. My next involvement with them, I mean, we had a... We went on a farm holiday with them once, which Vic and Bob made. I, I'd hired a place in the south of France. It was surprisingly cheap and quite large and invited friends out the first week and my brothers and sisters and their family out the second week. Jim and Bob joined us. They drove all the way over on old Norton motorcycles, um, which was not wise. And Bob almost <laughs> got killed on the final stretch. They arrived quite shaken. He'd almost been in a bad accident. He just somehow... we. Good, good luck and good driving has saved himself. But that was a, it was a really fun week. I don't remember that much of it because, of course, we were drunk most of the time. But it was Jim and Bob, then Paul Morley was there, who, of course, I think he was already a big Vic Rees fan. And that's how the collaboration with the album came about. Because right. that was Paul Morley's signed Vic for the album deal. Mm. Um, Roland Rivron was there with us, you know, it was, it was Steve, <laughs> Steve Naive. So it was all the people I was working with TV at the time. Obviously, our partners and 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 there was a there was a forest fire that almost came onto the property at one night. And because it was coming closer, we all put dinner suits on and stood down and just watched it. It was very bizarre. Um, so we'll carry on at the Kyber. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> terrible, terrible behaviour by English people. And then Vic came on holiday with me once or twice as well. I always I always knew Vic much more than Bob, and I it's weird because I I always thought Bob sort of slightly didn't like me. And I didn't realise how introverted he was. And bizarrely, mm. I'm sort of an introvert when I'm not doing stuff. And so I think we just were wary of inserting ourselves in each other's life. I'm much closer to him now, bizarrely. I don't, I don't see either of them often, but I feel much closer to him than I did then. Um, and I've spoken to him a few times and done a few things with him. But I was always much closer with Vic. So Vic would come out with us on holiday sometimes with his then wife and uh, his little baby when he had first had his first daughter to our place in Florida and we hung out. We had a great day once we went out and we decided that we wanted to, this was before we were, we drove down to Miami or North Miami. And this was before Miami became hip again. It was still really just a retirement area. So it's like 89 maybe before all the investment had gone in. And we found this department store under a hotel that had been untouched since the 60s. And we bought sort of like old men golfing outfits. Yeah. So we bought it's so like the old kind of knitted top and the pastel coloured trousers and awful shoes and little hats. And then we went and played mini golf the afternoon. <laughs> so we had some very lovely times together. And then my next involvement in probably was when I was fishing around for what to do next. And so my career has been like like most people, it's somewhat like a roller coaster. You know, one minute very high, and then not being able to find much work, and then high again and and so I think I was at one of my, my cyclical lows and I was trying to develop something with Chris Evans, who I'd met, he'd come down, I met him as a producer first, as a radio producer, he'd come down to London for where he'd been on radio in, in the north, I think somewhere near Warrington or somewhere. And he was producing me on a radio show on Virgin and we got on quite well, but he was very spiky. And then he did the big breakfast, which was huge. And then I was cast around for work and, this agent and I said, look, Chris really li likes what you do. You should try and work with him. He's got great ideas. So I started developing an idea with Chris. And I was in Chris's house in his garden in North London one night. We were developing. And he said, what are you doing later? And I, he said, we should, we're getting some good ideas down there. Work. I said, no, I'm doing a favour for someone tonight. I'm going on a pile of a show. He said, what show is that? I said, it's this new thing Vic and Bob are doing. He said, oh, he said, I love Vic and Bob. I said, yeah. And they, I, so I found him. And, and I think they, they didn't have a guest. They'd lost a guest or something. And I said, oh, I'm here with Chris. Evans, would you like Chris to do it if he wants to do it? So Chris, I think, did the pilot with me. I think he's in the one in the first series. It's not episode two or something, but the pilot, I think it was you and Noddy Holder, Wendy Richards. Donny, but Danny Baker. Danny Baker was, was, was team captain with Ulrika as a team member. And John Peel came out in the end in a baby. No, that's the second That's the second <laughs> one, yeah. That's the second with uh, Chris Evans in. Chris Evans' uh, one is the... Uh... And was I in the one with Chris? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. And Danny okay. Baker might be in that one as well, actually. I think he's well, that's, how that, yeah. that, that's yeah. how that night happened then. That's how that night happened. Yeah. So the pilot, here's the thing about the pilot. So they said, would you do the pilot and the pilot? And, of course, you know, even though I was sort of angry with Channel X, I so loved Vic and Bob. Of course, I would do anything they asked. Mm. So I um, I said yes, and Danny had said yes. So I knew Danny quite well by then. I loved Danny. And um, we turned up. <laughs> here's the thing about the pilots. We did the pilot. And the pilot was... 
everything was there once again. All the things you see in the show were there. After the show, both Danny and me went up to Rick and Bob and said, fellas, this is a fucking disaster. It's absolutely not going to be a hit. You do not want to be involved. It's going to kill your crew. Trust us. We know. We've been around. Yeah. We know what we're talking about. Don't do it. And it turned out to be a bigger fucking hit Bob, than probably anything me or Danny have done. But we were, we were convinced we were right. We were convinced. And once again, that's that interesting thing about Vic and Bobby. Is they've got this unique sense of what works for mm. them. In a way, it kind of doesn't seem to matter whether anyone else gets it. Yeah. You know, they're so self contained that, that, that it works for them. That's fine. That's all they wanted out of it. So, of course, Shooting Stars was huge. Love that. Uh, I wasn't involved in the Saturday show they did. I'm trying to think what anything else I've done with it recently. Oh, one thing we should talk about briefly is before the big night out, I'd had. Jim, Vic did two spots from the last resort. So the first time was in series two, and he came on as Leslie Cooper, street artist. <laughs> yeah. And the idea was, I always like, I always like the idea of it being a live show. I like something happening during the show that had a yeah. resolution. And I said, what would be great is, and I think he wanted to be a street artist. I said, great, well, can you do all the guests? And then at the end, we'll give them the picture. And so he did them on plates. Yeah. And then yeah. what, what was annoying was at the end of the show, because it was quite wild, and this was at US, at the end of the show, he'd done these fucking webpages and a bunch of people in the audience rushed forward and grabbed the fucking plates and ran off. So they all disappeared. That'd be worth a few quid now. eBay. <laughs> not, not all about the money, kids. Exactly. <laughs> um, so he did that. And then the second time he came on, he was Silas Proud Harvest, the farmer. Yeah. And the idea, I, I like doing theme show on the last resort. And it wasn't one that worked particularly well. It was maybe like a village fair. It didn't really work that one. Mm. Had a few good. David Frost was in it. Ended up with him blowing up a a rubber doll of a woman for some reason, which was so bizarre. I think it'd be one of the fake prizes or something. And he was Silas Proud of the farmer who came on talking about how he, he made musical instruments out of his vegetable. And I remember afterwards, and it didn't go down well, <laughs> but I said the whole show that night didn't work because it was one of those nights that the aha bloke wouldn't have enjoyed. And um, <laughs> yeah. I remember afterwards, there was an old sound guy who worked on the show who was very kind of like man of few words. His name was Frank. I saw him once nearly have a stroke when he had to fix a radio mic on Maria Whitaker, who was wearing who was wearing the strapless dress, and he he was shaking. He didn't know he was in his sort of sixties. He didn't know what, but he was seventies. He had a long white beard. So Frank came up to me afterwards, and I said, "Oh, all right, Frank, what do you think of the show tonight?" He went, "Not good." I went, "Yeah, I agree." He went, "I tell you what, that fucking farm," he said, "if he hadn't had that cucumber flu, he'd have died on his ass." <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was the only laugh Jim got was he had a flute that's meant to be recorded and the music came out and the audience kind of understood that whereas the rest yeah. of his stuff because there was no grounding for him it was like we dropped him in and they didn't know who he was it was it didn't work and it, 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 there needs to be a sense of why it's happening I think for people yeah. to feel comfortable laughing about it so that, those were the first two things I did with Jim um, but then obviously the big night out, and then knocked down ginger, wasn't there? On um, oh yeah, oh yeah, that was great with Paul Whitehouse well, and Charlie Hickson and Kathy Burke. Yeah. And well, knocked down ginger was this was a I don't know why we did it. We we moved to a Sunday night a live show that no one watched, and it was called One Hour with Jonathan Watson. Fuck me, why I was what I was trying to do. I think I was listening to the wrong people, and also I was feeling I didn't understand that you could do shows you wanted to do. I thought you had to do the shows that critics went to. And people would always say, oh, he doesn't do proper interviews. So we did a serious bit of the, bit of the show, which was a sort of a fucking debate that was hideous. And then I'd always, I loved Remote Control, which was the quiz show on MTV. And I loved the craziness of characters coming out. So I wanted mm. something like that. And I came up with the idea of Knock Down Ginger, the game you played with as a kid. Because I, I like the idea as well of like the big set. I like the idea of big TV, strange TV. I initially wanted the set to be transparent. I was to be perspex, but we couldn't do that. I don't know why. And it worked better as doors anyway. And I remember Jim and Bob particularly enjoyed doing it. We, the night we had Gilbert and George on, and that was the night Bob came out as a butcher from around the door. And he said, meat is murder, says Morris here, the Smith. And it fucking is when you're trying to get a side of beef out your van at two in the morning. It was something <laughs> like that. We wound up at the end of the show dancing to uh, Bend It, you know, by Vicky, Nicky, Mick and Titch, whatever they're called. Uh, yeah. Freddie, no, was it Freddie and the Dreamers? I can't remember. And uh, while dancing around this side of beef on the floor, me, Vic, <laughs> Bob, Gilbert, and George. <laughs> you, be, you kind of don't get that on TV much anymore. Um, and that was great. It was great working with Paul and Charlie. They did some great characters on there as well. 
Yeah, it, but it was a peculiar shout. It was a very odd slot because that was traditionally in TV back then when TV was much more, it was much less fragmented as then. That was the kind of drama spot on both mm. BBC and ITV and they had big devoted following. So we were, we're still getting a million or something. But we weren't mm. getting anyone much. Um, I don't think they worked on Saturday Zoo, did they? That was... They did, they did something when they were you were interviewing them as Millie Vanilli because that's on YouTube. I do not remember that. Yeah, well, is it? Is it, it might be tonight with Jonathan Ross a bit later. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> they guess as Millie Vanilli. I'll send you a link. I did something on that. I remember I had Dudley Moore on once and I said, Dudley, I want to do something different. And I persuaded him to pretend to be his brother, uh, Ray Moore, who had been a panel beater in Dagenham and never got out and was angry at Dudley. Uh, <laughs> that was a fun night. So we do a lot of stuff like that. But once again, whatever we did on that show, that weird, that was three times a week on Channel 4, we'd have a show with no guests that anyone had heard of and we'd get one and a half million. And then we'd have mm. another week. One week we had Mel Gibson. One week we had Audrey Hepburn. And we'd still get one and a half million. It was just bizarre, you know. Yes. So we kind of did a lot of things that perhaps we shouldn't have done, like me interviewing the boys pretending to be Millie Vanilli, which yeah. I'm sure you would not be able to do today. But, yes, yeah, you say Saturday Zoo, I mean, you were always bringing in the latest comedy talents. I mean, on that, so you got John Thompson, Simon Day, John Shuttleworth, okay. uh, Steve well, Coogan, think, um, of course. Vic and Bob steered me to Simon Day because they'd so, so do, was it called, was it Charlie? No, Tommy, Tommy Cockles. Tommy yeah. Cockles, yeah. They yeah. Tommy Cockles, and I said, so well, that's why we got in touch with Simon. It was uh, Vic and Bob had seen him doing it live, and they loved his stuff. But they always had an affection for, like, Charlie Chuck, but I never really understood. Mm. <laughs> He's an acquired taste. <laughs> yeah. I mean, not that I'm accusing, but I always felt like, I felt a bit uncomfortable always. I always <laughs> felt like he actually needed help. <laughs> yeah. Far be it for me to be sensitive. About <laughs> um, so yeah, so so there were, but, but it was a very interesting time. It was a very different time. I don't think I, you know. I can't say uh, it's not happening now, but I'm not aware of it happening now, as no. I probably would be because I'm an old bloke. But but certainly it was a very v sort of fertile time for for strange comedy and interesting performers. Well, now it would go online, I guess, rather than on mainstream. Yeah, Saturday night TV. there are a lot of strange character comics, comedy stuff online now. A lot of people try it out, but it's kind of harder to stand out, I guess. Yeah, if you put it on TV now, it'd be on X Factor and it'll be laughed at. There's supposedly be a novelty act to be laughed at, to be mocked yeah. rather than like to be Britain's enjoyed. Got Talent kind of thing. Yeah, that's what yeah. I meant, I think. Yeah. Shame. Well, I did a little comedy thing during COVID because I knew that the younger comedians weren't getting any work. I persuaded Channel 4 to put a little thing on. It was called Comedy Cafe. I wanted to call it Bat Soup Cafe, and they quite rightly said no. <laughs> um, <laughs> I wonder why. Yeah, um, I'm glad they taught me out of that. And uh, we had a lot of kind of newer comedians. It was much more straightforward. And there was much in the way of character stuff. But um, it didn't write particularly well, which I didn't expect it to. But they didn't want to try more. And it wasn't, they, I just thought they felt like, I think they feel that that place, the, the, the net exists for that now. That that is what YouTube's for, you know, and they they don't feel they can compete, and they don't feel they should. So they're looking for stuff which is going to get, you know, keep their mainstream audience happy, rather than try and lure in younger people. Because I think they fear that that audience has lost them anyway. Yeah, you see, see the same comedians on each. It's panel shows, isn't it? Now they so that's where they. Yeah, I can't on. say. Well, I don't do many anymore, but I don't really watch that many of them. But but I mean, it's it's changed. At least you know now in the last few years. Now you do have a much greater diversity on those panel shows, you know. So, mm. so it's quite interesting that way. So they become less kind of like men shouting over each other. Mm. Um, but but it's it's still yeah, you're right. It's still there's a roster of the same faces one sees on. Yeah, a lot of yeah. it seems to be very scripted as well, doesn't it? You know, you you kind of think it's all off the top of their heads, but then you hear oh, it's all it's all very scripted. You know what? Most of the panel shows I've worked on is not that scripted. I mean, when I did, they, when I did, they think it's all over. A lot of my stuff was given to me by writers, but mm. I'd work with them on stuff in the afternoon. But that was a kind of different. And, and the reason why I asked that issue is because I know fuck all about sport. I know a bit more now, but when I agreed, they they kept asking me for years to that. I kept saying, guys, I don't know anything about sport. <laughs> I Finally, I did it, and they liked it. And then I got right back, and then I became like a regular, and it actually was a good thing for me. But a lot of that was was given to me mainly because I didn't know any of the sporting names. Mm. So if I want to make a joke about something, they'd say, OK, well, you should say blah, 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 like Graham LaSalle. And I would say I didn't know what it meant. But when I've done shows, other panel shows, like um, which ones have I done? I haven't done, I only done Have I Got News For You once with Peter Cook. And I've only done QI once. I'm not really a fan of them, really. I find them a bit, in the same way that I've never released Radio 4, you know what I mean? That kind of 
very university sort of middle class stuff. <laughs> yeah. Just, yeah, yeah, isn't for me. I'm not saying I'm not being negative about it. I'm just saying it isn't for me. Um, but I've done. I did Celebrity Juice a few times. Which other ones are there? Oh, I've done Eight Out of Ten Cats a few times. I quite like doing that. And that's quite weird when you think about it. What they do on Eight Out of Ten Cats Me Countdown with Joe on and all that. They often have strange comic on that. And you know, yeah. like Sean had such a distinctive voice when he was yeah, still with yeah. us. But that wasn't. You never knew. Obviously, you're playing a game there, so it's different to a panel show in that respect. But um, you never knew what Jimmy was going to throw at you. You never knew what was coming your way, really. Um, and you, so most of that was spontaneous. But I think maybe on things like Mock the Week, which one's going to have never gone, I assume they're giving some kind of guideline. Yeah. You know? But I don't mind that. It doesn't matter to me. You know, I don't feel that's cheating. I just feel like if you were doing a show like Bedil and Skinner Unplanned and they planned it all, that would be cheating. Yeah. <laughs> time. But other than that, I think, you know, it's just the welcome to show business. See, some people ask to be told, you know, some people do ask to be told. Some people, I know, I know some comedians who feel very unprotected unless they have the chance to work on their stuff, whereas other people are more spontaneous anyway, you know, just naturally. I knew a writer who worked on 8 out of 10 Cats and he's, I remember he said, and he was given like the afternoon with some of the, the guests to discuss what the, what the, they could talk about and he had bob one week and he pretty much why am i even here why am i in the room because this bob will just do what yeah. bob does and th there was another story about peter andre which was very different to peter but peter <laughs> andre came in with his own material which none of it made sense it was something oh, like but, um but that's the show i'd like to see <laughs> yeah it was something like you know in christmas in australia we bob is on the beach and that was the gag pretty much so oh yeah that was it we barbies on the beach so we have cold turkey get it's it cold turkey it's, cold, <laughs> it's charming in its own way um but yeah i've never done that on a and gets mainly because i'm too fucking guard I, I guard my time too badly so i always try and turn up literally as late as possible yeah. <laughs> yeah. i normally say what time do you need me there well we we like a month about two i went no we have lunch. I don't need lunch. What time are you going on? <laughs> Six. I'll be there at half five, you know. Um, but yeah, sometimes, you know, you want to, whenever I turn up for a show, though, and I'm sure most people feel the same way, if you agree to show, you want to do as good a job as possible for that show. Not even for yourself. Obviously, inevitably, you, you do benefit from it, but you want to do, you, you're there to make the show work, you know. And some people do need more help, I guess. But it's a shame when you, because I, I, I can imagine that, like, not Peter Andre per se, but someone who isn't necessarily known for being funny, when they get given scripted material, it normally feels scripted. Mm. Whereas you've worked on some jokes with a comedian, they normally find a way of making it feel, feel Put fresh. Put voice in it, yeah. 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 Uh, even the stuff that Bob's done on Would I Lie to You, just incredible. You know. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, he is. It, what's interesting about Bob is that he has such a unique voice, you know, and that's, that's rare because normally comedy is, it, most people in comedy it's a craft and they work on it you know there's a quote from Seinfeld was talking recently about something Chris Rock had said he taught some comedian and said what do you do during the daytime he said oh, I don't do anything much I hang out there because I make money at night and Chris Rock said no no you work during the day you collect the money <laughs> you collect the money at night. you know and you should be working on your jokes in the daytime and then at night is when you have the fun of performing it and get the cash and uh, so a lot of people are it is that craft whereas with Bob you get the feeling it is sort of just him i mean he would say things sometimes they were so funny and so on but you couldn't work out why they were funny you know i remember one saying to me something like oh that's satisfying it's like you know when you you learn a bit of carpet you do that last little bit on the step and you just get up to the edge and you just got enough carpet <laughs> and i'm thinking yes that is satisfying it's also <laughs> funny but i don't know <laughs> where that's come from you know so presumably he thinks about this stuff during the daytime <laughs> he knows how his mind works yeah. So you're a, obviously you're a famed, also been a film critic. I love your podcast with Honey, oh, thank the you. Um, thank Real you. Talk, which is great. I enjoy doing it. Yeah. Um, and this talk, and we've mentioned it many times on this on this podcast about the glove, which supposedly is going to be Vic and Bob's film. Yeah. Do you have high they, hopes. Oh, there's one story I want to tell you about before we get to the glove. But oh. no, well, the glove. Well, I have high hopes. The thing about Vic and Bob is is. <sighs> Everything they do or everything they've done, I think even if I haven't understood it at first, I've gone on to really enjoy it afterwards. So the glove might come out and be a massive critical and commercial flop, but I imagine five years afterwards, people are going, that was fucking amazing. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I would imagine for it. They did tell me about it once. I can't remember much about the glove. Um, but here's a story I should tell you. Which I don't even, do you know about Morrissey almost appeared on Big Night Out? 
<laughs> Morrissey agreed to do Big Night Out, and this was before he became problematic to some, um, <laughs> when he was like this kind of elusive but much admired indie god, basically. And he was a huge fan of Vic and Bob. And they were thrilled, of course, because they loved the Smiths. And um, he agreed to do it. And on the day, and I've still got it somewhere, it'll be here somewhere. I've got a box full of old stuff here. I've got, I've got the original Weekender script here somewhere, and I've got some of the early Big Night Out scripts from the oh, wow. to go down to the shoots. I've got them knocking around here somewhere. And I've got this fax. This is the days before emails. <laughs> on the day it's meant to come, Marcy sent a fax to the studio <laughs> saying he was sorry he couldn't come, but it was a supposedly a fax from his doctor, Dr. Felch. Who said <laughs> he was he can come? He was having a bit of the old arse trouble. <laughs> um, so he pulled out, and we were all disappointed, but we kind of sort of <laughs> expected him not to come. But he was going to be a guest, just come out during what's on the end of your stick or one of those things. I think he was going to come out on those bits where people, you know, surprise people come out. Um, so I've got that here somewhere. Uh, the glove I don't know much about really. I mean, I you know I hope it happens if they want to make it. Um, and I hope it happens quickly because none of us are getting any younger. <laughs> yeah. Some have health issues, obviously, which we hope doesn't ever, you know, turn too bad for, for Bob, bless him. Um, but, yeah, no, I'd love to see it. I don't know much about it. But, you know, it's interesting, though, because rarely, rarely do double acts transfer well to the big screen. You know, yeah. Michael Myers didn't manage it. Even like, I know he's not a double act, but Hancock's films, even though I like both of them, yeah, didn't weren't as good as his TV work. It's a harder thing to write for. And I, I, even though I did like The Weekenders, it's not as much fun as Big Night Out or Shooting Stars or some of the other stuff, mm -hmm. you know. And so I think it's a, it's a, there's a very different discipline and very different structure that you need when you, when you write a, a standalone piece. And mm. I don't know whether they, they will, will nail that, but I'm sure whatever they do, there'll be stuff in it that we love. Yeah. Well, they have, uh, there's a, a little film quiz for you and you can play along as well, Paula, if you so wish. <laughs> they have appeared in films before can you name there's two films that jim and bob have both been in and one with jim on his own but hold it jim and bob... no okay they were both in once upon a time in the midlands the shane meadows film in a brief cameo as two clowns having a fight with someone as far as a steel lecker churchill the hollywood years uh, peter years. richardson comic strip uh... film Churchill, yeah, yeah, yeah. and he lost he lost that gig when he was done for drunk driving. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, not not Churchill the dog. Churchill oh, Hollywood, yeah. oh, which um, they played two very camp um, like uh, footmen to the palace, um, yes, in which yes, yes. Bob Gibb well, delivers one. Churchill the Hollywood years, the, the Peter one, Richardson yeah. comic strip film oh, with mate, Christian okay. Slater. Christian Slater, yeah. I mean, yeah. neither of those are let's face it, no, big no. films. No. I mean, you're talking to someone who's in Spice World, the movie. Yeah. Come on. Come Bob, on. Bob does deliver my, one of my favourite lines in, in movie history in that film, which is right up there, which is when he is one of the footmen and he is trying to kidnap Princess Elizabeth and she bites his hand and runs off and he just shakes his hand and says, oh, that's me fucking wanking hand. <laughs> 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 Which is up there with, frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn to me. Yeah. Doesn't get much better. Doesn't get much better. I, mean, I think, I think, to be honest with you, joyful though that is, it's not what Bob would want to be remembered for. <laughs> no. I don't know. Like, yeah. the, thing, the thing about Jim and Bobby's, the thing about Vic and Bob's and Julie's, it was always so much, see, I'm someone you'd expect to reach for a lazy wank joke, right? <laughs> They're not. You know what I mean? What I loved about that and what I continue to love about them is that it was so peculiar and so much of its own world that it worked against all the odds almost. You know what I mean? They didn't come out and they weren't doing traditional standard structured jokes. Yeah, they weren't yeah. doing standard material. It was just fucking peculiar. And yet it was peculiar because it was consistent. There was a there was a logic, an internal logic to it. That makes a beautiful sense, you know. And I think they, they work better when they're in their own world. I don't think they work particularly better mm. out of it. I mean, even mm. like, you know, the fishing show, that's their own little world, him and Paul. Well, it's they're peculiar and they're surreal, and yet they've always got one foot in reality with some of their references to modern yeah. culture and, and, you know, what we all grew up with. Yeah, which well, I mean... Jim was the first one to do that, that was well. I remember when he'd do something on the big night and he goes, it's about this time of night, I like to put a Cadillac under a bunny. You know, stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, and then yeah. look at it now. I remember joking with Alan Carr once, and I said, if there weren't fucking products like Glade Air Freshener, you wouldn't have an act. 
you know, because <laughs> a lot of his <laughs> act did rely on him making something right. funnier by naming the specific, quite mundane product. And by the way, yeah. I love Alan Carr. I'm doing him a great disservice there. But but Jim did that a lot first. And I don't think I'd ever heard anyone do that, you know, before him. Well, Victoria Wood would do something, the mundane stuff. But then you had like your surreal Monty Python, Spike Milligan stuff. And Jim yeah. brought it together, really. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Because I never... Jim and Bob never used to, I know they used to quite like Spike. I think they're quite like Q9. They never ever spoke to me about Python. I mean, Jim's references always seem to be much more just kind of like the weirdness of old show business, like, you yeah. know, Northern Club comics and that culture around it, the idea around it. You know, I mean, the whole thing, you could look at the whole thing, especially the early stuff, but all of this stuff, it, it, all of it is almost like an, an art project. Yeah. You know, they're like like in the way that the best post-punk music was all coloured by the fact that so many of them had gone through, because back in the glorious days before you needed to pay for your education, you could go to university free. And so a lot of people went to art college and did those kind of courses. And I think that's certainly where Jim did. And Bob, not so much. He was already working as a barrister, I think. But, but Bob, uh, Jim did. And, and that you can see there's that kind of odd approach to take this element and it's almost like a Brian Eno approach to to making comedy as opposed to I'm a working comic who has to go out and deliver the goods it's like what's going to give me an interesting result that I haven't seen before and I mean that's the thing that I loved most about them was from the moment I first saw them I thought okay the only other comic I felt this way about was probably Steve Martin when I first saw him when I was very young it was, mm. it was like here's someone doing something that I haven't seen done before mm. Have you watched you know, the new documentary, the two-part documentary? I haven't seen it yet. You know, it's a weird thing. It's a bit like David Bowie. When there's someone whose work I've really loved a lot and I felt very special for me, I almost don't want to watch other people appreciating it. Yeah, yeah. Because it feels like, hold on, that belongs to me. Fuck mm. off. You know? Yeah. And I know it's stupid, but it doesn't make any difference. And I will get around to watching it eventually. It's good. I, I hear it's good. Yeah, the, the first half is basically called Before and then the second part is called After. And Before, you're kind of looking at him from a kid uh, and sort of how he started performing and like working at Disneyland and you he know worked at crazy Berry rise Farm. to fame. He worked at Knott's Berry Farm, didn't he? Some, yeah, yeah, it was something like that. Yeah, I it's remember like, I went there. Once. I visited the tent he worked in just to see it. <laughs> yeah, he was doing yeah. magic and. Yeah. So it was that way that any, documentary though. Because he used to write jokes and anything that he thought he'd seen before, he threw it out. Mm. Which is an amazing discipline, an amazing way of putting Oh, you are being very needy. Aren't you? <laughs> That's the dog. This is Jonathan's dog, listeners. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, spooky. Well, it's also Matt a bit. Yeah, although we are, yeah. Yeah, Matt's always like, oh, things I have to put up with, Jonathan, you know. I, I don't want to know, frankly. <laughs> it's but... not a counseling session. I charge more. <laughs> You're right, what you're saying though, John. I mean, Jim has always said he's never never grew up on comedy, it was music and it was art. And yes, what's really yeah, and that's what you know, and that's why when you know another group that came along about the same time or slightly later that were amazing was Mighty Bush, of course, and mm. that had the same feeling where they, they were deliberately not using reference points or structures that you'd seen often before, they were creating their own peculiar universe and League of Gentlemen to a lesser extent. Mm. But League of Gentlemen as well. So, the, the, you know, so the, we were lucky that we had so much of that kind of like really, um, what's the word? Not experimental, but innovative comedy. Yeah, yeah. Thing. Uh, by the way, uh, the, the other film Jim was in on his own was Funny Cow, which was a couple of years back with Max and Peak, <laughs> which is on uh, uh, Channel 4, I, I think. Although I, I have a love for cinema and I watch <laughs> almost anything, <laughs> I haven't seen any of those three films, and I can't really say I feel I've missed out that much. The last one's good, funny. It's Maxine Peake as a comedian. Kevin Rowland's also got a, a cameo in it. As well, <laughs> which is something else. Now, you're, now you're really putting me off it. <laughs> you're not selling it, Matt. You're not selling it. <laughs> really not. It's worth it. It's worth it. We did a pilot for Saturday Zoo, and when we did the pilot, the woman in charge of Channel 4 at the time in commission was called eight, Andrea Wonfor, and... She saw the pilot and afterwards I spoke to her and, and, and the pilot wasn't good. I mean, the series wasn't great. It had great moments in it, but it wasn't great. And I said to her afterwards, Aiden, what do you think? She said, I've got to be honest with you. It's the worst pilot I've ever seen in my life. Wow. I went, oh, right. So, so we're not going to do a series. She went, no, I'm going to commission a series because we haven't got anything else. <laughs> <laughs> it was a gap. <laughs> with that glowing praise, we set out to make a series. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us, Jonathan. That the really pleasure. was quite a boast. Fantastic. Pleasure. Thanks so go. much, Jonathan.
My pleasure. Nice to meet you both. Lovely and to you. Meet you. Take care. And both of you try and get out sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Sitting indoors, thinking about fucking comedians. Thank you all for listening to this edition of Quadaboast. Special thanks to Matt Lucas for permission to use the Peanuts music as our theme tune. And thanks to Ed Lewis for this edit. Thank you to Jake Chesson for permission to use the photo from his 1995 shoot of Jim and Bob in our various online locations for the podcast. And of course, thank you very much to Jim Moyer and Bob Mortimer, without whom this podcast, well, it just wouldn't exist, would it? Remember to check out Paula's Divine Comedians podcast as well and to join the Reza Mortimer Depository of Curious Stuff Facebook group. And I think you'll agree that really was a lot of fun. Goodbye.